RCR with Paul Brennan, Reality Check Radio. Friday morning, time for our political panel here at RCR. Cam Slater, Marty Gibson and Olivia Pearson in the RCR house. Welcome all. Hello, Good morning. Paul. Good morning. Good morning. Nice, to, nice to be here with my fellow panelists, sound thinkers. Panel beaters. <laughs> Okay, so plenty to talk about, and uh, let's launch into, should we start with polls again, do you think? Yeah, look, I don't think we need to get into the numbers because the numbers are a foregone conclusion. But this week we've had uh, a One News poll and a News Hub poll both saying pretty much the same thing, that National and Act can't get there by themselves, that they're going to need Winston Peters and New Zealand First to form a government. There's absolutely no hope of Labour, Greens and Te Party Māori getting even close to the required 61 seats. Uh, and even if they, you know, the media like talking about, oh, but they could form a, a, a coalition with Labour as well. You know, Christopher Hitkins spent a, a considerable amount of time in the, both the leaders' debates talking about the coalition of chaos. And, of course, the media have picked that up as well. Um, but, you know, if he wants to govern, he's going to need to have four parties and two of those parties have got co-leaders. So you've got six leaders that are going to be, if that's a recipe for for chaos, you know, you can't find a worse one than that. A hydra. Exactly. We've had three party governments before. They work okay. Um, you know, we, we're always going to have this problem as long as we have MMP, which is forever. So, you know, you'll hear people say, oh, we should have chosen STV. Well, we didn't. You know, so let's just deal with reality. Yeah, how's this for a bold, um, well, it's not a prediction, but um, what if ACT is out of the picture? Well, there's a distinct chance of that. And and I've talked about this. And it really upsets uh, ACT people when you do. But with Seymour's you know, cack-handed attacks against New Zealand First and Winston Peters, his vote has stalled. And, in fact, it's probably going backwards a little bit, whereas Winston Peters and New Zealand First vote has gone up. So, you know, there was a brilliant Tremaine uh, cartoon yesterday, which has David Seymour holding a smoking shotgun and, and has stumps for, f- <laughs> stumps for <Sure> feet. <laughs> right, He's got sure stumps did. for feet. And uh, in the cartoon, uh, you know, he's he, uh, there's these little characters down the bottom that are saying, well, well, you know, what's happened? What, what's Winston Peters done to, 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 to upset to, Seymour to upset so much? Seymour. And, and the little character down the bottom says, oh, well, he went and talked to the Patriots at Parliament. The Patriots. The, the Patriots, Patriots you know, on the now, lawn. This is Tremaine in the New Zealand Herald. Yeah. You know that that that, that is that is a watershed moment right there. Mm. That yeah. they're talking yeah. about yeah. the people who went to Wellington and supported the protest and were there at the protest and and backed the protest are patriots. That's in the do, New Zealand Herald. Do you ever notice that when uh, David Seymour was talking about uh, reasons to have a strong economy? Normally, one of the first things out of his mouth is a really good reason to have one is that you get good pharmaceuticals. And I I do wonder if that's the reason that he's shooting his foot off going after Winston Peters rather than doing what he was doing, which was working really well for him, which was uh, pointing out what we could be doing better economically. You'd have to explain why, though, you'd you'd go that way when everything surely points to that doesn't fly. Maybe he's getting getting sponsored by someone who really doesn't want people talking about it. Brought to you by Pfizer. (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, ab- you know, but, but there are Pfizer me, bank I mean, accounts. I mean, I can think of all sorts of great reasons to have a strong economy. You know, you, you can provide better education, people's health gets better, you look after the environment better. Human you flourishing. Great you can afford things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can eat good food. Having great pharmaceuticals certainly isn't the first thing to roll off my tongue when I think about a reason to have a strong economy. I mean, economy. there's better ways to say that. Like uh, uh, improved health outcomes. Yeah, he's very specific. <laughs> right, improved health outcomes is better hospitals, uh, better treatment options. At the moment, the status quo. I, I'd much rather have a coalition of chaos, as they keep. You know, they're, yeah, they're so going on I. about. It's much more fun. Yeah, well, and, you know, 
I'd rather have a coalition of chaos than a coalition of communists, which <laughs> Labour, Greens and Te Party Māori would certainly be. At the moment, the status quo is our government sleepwalking us into globalist totalitarian. So I want to see a coalition of chaos. I want there to be a massive spanner in the works. I want there to be a political fight for nationalism and the Kiwi way, uh, rather than, you know, calmly and quietly and civilly losing our sovereignty to supranational bodies overseas. And getting like, rogered in the process. Well, yeah. How hard would it be for Luxon to say that when, when Hipkins does come out and say it'll be a uh, coalition of chaos? You know, just to say, hey, look, we're, we're used to dissenting views being squashed by this government. You know, what you're saying is a coalition of chaos is just hashing out differences of opinion. And he can't be seen to, en- to endorse Winston, though, Marty. That's the thing. Can yeah, that, well, well, that's public. right. But what what happens that- though? What happens if if it, the Nats get freaked out because it's Winston? We can only deal with Winston if Act. You know, well, we that, that, more. Could they go with the Greens? Could they go with the Greens and Act? Well, if you look at the politics of, of of Christopher Luxon, you could you you have to be able to say yes. You can't categorically say no way, can you? How would the Nat voters it, take it, that it, though? It's like the- like a like a bucket of cold sick. Of course, like a bucket of cold sick, and and. I tell you, net, net, uh, zero net carbon um, is Christopher Luxon's biggest issue. He cares about that more than yeah. he cares about the economy. So That I phrase you used, we're fixated on it. We're, ab- yeah. we're absolutely fixated absolutely. on it. What a weird thing to say. A Freudian was. slip. Well, well, given he presided over the... Um... You know the uh, the spreading of uh, of of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere for how many years, burning thousands and millions of tons of jet fuel everywhere. So he probably knows a bit about that. Yeah, but it, but he woke a boy. He woke a fight in New Zealand though at the same time. But yeah, but they still burnt the the jet A one, didn't yeah, they? Didn't stop but, doing that. Know. Look, he he just wants he look he's just so sopping wet. He's been standing in a puddle of his own making for so long that he's got mildew on the bottom of his trousers up to the knees. Well, I mean, did you notice that um, Seymour described Winston as the least uh, least trustworthy person in New Zealand politics and said, we're not going to sit around the cabinet table with this clown. He then said that he wouldn't fight Winston Peters because it would be elder abuse. The guy's a... And, and, and Winston retorted that David Seymour reminds me of a chihuahua at the front gate barking at every cat, human being, or fellow dog that passes. <laughs> fellow dog. <laughs> oh, dear. But, oh, you know, dear. I mean, the, the polls, the polls, just to get us back on track for the discussion, the back polls, on track. Thank the you. polls are emphatic. Yeah. We're going to have a change of government, right? And so now what we're doing – as we're discussing what that government looks like. And I think there's a distinct possibility that New Zealand First may start taking votes off ACT. ACT's clearly run out of national voters to take votes off now, and they're stalled. Uh, and you're going to see a, a fair bit of the soft Labour vote, what remains of it, go to New Zealand First too, which, you know, you've got to hand it to Winston. of all. Of, if you look at all of the campaigns so far, you know, and what have we got? Two weeks left to go. If you look at all of the campaigns so far, you've got Winston Peters as a standout campaigner, and that's not because I'm biased. I'm just looking at it analytically. So he had, you know, his horse ad. I mean, you had to laugh about the horse ad. That was so a, Northland. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but, it's not but the it, horse ad, Cam. It's the Southern Man ad. Yeah, that's right. But oh, but so here's the thing: then. every time the, they have a poll, and and we saw it on TV one on the one news poll, and we saw it on the news hub poll. They go, Winston's back, and this guess what? The TV stations then ran. They ran Winston on his horse. Going, <laughs> at least, this is not at our least first he had radio. his shirt on. <laughs> yeah, like he could have gone all gone all Putin, you know. But but the thing is, is he got, uh, you know, free media, basically. Well, that's what you get when you've got good pictures, when you yeah. create good pictures. Then you had Shane Jones singing this, you know, thing, and then there's pirate shanty with on the wig. TikTok as well with the wig. <laughs> but it's spread everywhere. It's hilarious. And then you've got uh, him getting, again, free media as a result of the poll, uh, as a result of the leaders' debate on Wednesday night, where Hipkins attacked one of uh, New Zealand First's candidates for saying something 
rather anodyne, really. And now it's all over the news that this candidate said something. And what's also all over the news is Winston Peters says, I back him 100%. Handing an object lesson to David Seymour on how you handle comments from candidates. You back them. You don't throw them under the bus. And like, and look what he did to Maureen Pugh. And who was the other guy? And there was another guy after that too. Yeah. Well, I mean, Winston's done that kind of thing in the past. Let's not let him off that. He's thrown people under the bus quite brutally in well, front of the media. Like, like Brendan Horan, but frankly, he deserved it. And Kim Caloney as well, I'm thinking back then. But um, but anyway, I mean, it's who? a new – it's a new. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> she was one of his candidates that um, was very, very anti-co-governance and was very vocal about it and oh, okay. yeah. too embarrassingly for Winston at that time. That was 2017. Okay. All yeah, right. but I mean, did anyone see the? Um, oh, Paul, you can direct. No, no, no. You, you segue to the next thing. Well, Dr. Alana Ratner sent a communique to the Freedom Movement voters yesterday, and I think her thinking is pretty sound and very much in line with my own. And I couldn't fo- fault her very well written communique. She said in there, New Zealand First is no longer a one-man band. Its senior leadership board candidates and members are mostly freedom people and that they get the reality of vaccine harms and its leader is ready to accept the baton and the responsibility the party has handed him. They are taking it to the government and the old media who have collaborated to shatter the country. With this absolutely crucial election, it's time to focus everyone on what's best for New Zealand. Minor party leaders who continue to tell their supporters that there is a chance of success are being very unfair to them and to everyone else. Mm. Um, And she went on to say... Here come the emails. (laughs) Yeah. She went on to say, there is no loss of face in standing aside in order to achieve the best possible outcome for all freedom fighters. An additional 5% of the party vote could be given to New Zealand first. Thus, there would be no wasted vote allocation of seats to other parties. Now, I mean, her thinking is also in line with Guy Hatchard's thinking, who made his case. Um, and he made six points of why he would advocate voting for Winston Peters. Um, those six are the, in- the inquiry into the COVID response. The freedom movement has failed to unite, which it has. Many mm. policies are in harmony with freedom voters. Um, attracting good candidates, as Winston has done, who are patriots and who get the enormity of what we're up against, um, New Zealand First is evolving beyond just Winston, and that's, I have to say, personally, I mean, I'm not the greatest fan of Winston for for being such a political pragmatist um, over many issues over the years. So the party evolving beyond him is very important to me. Mm. Um, and also... I'd well, be with we, you on that, Olivia. I'd, I'd probably be about where you are on that, I'd say. Yeah, because... Um, we don't have any political satire like McFell and Gadsby. So um, what we were referring to before with Shane Jones with a wig on his head singing a shanty, I mean, that's as good a satire as you're going to get in this yeah. flipping godforsaken country at the moment. Um, all, all that is beyond Winston. Winston is there at the moment, um, but he's triple vaxxed. Ha, ha, God knows how long he's going to be a, a, around. Um, I want to see the party evolving way beyond Winston, attracting really good people because they are patriots and because they are nationalists. That's a very good reason Mm. for them to be a banner. Well, it's Um, anti-establishment as well, isn't it? It's, you know, national and labor, you know, when they're saying, yep, yep, in unison, they're they're the establishment parties. Status quo parties. Yeah, absolutely. And, And the media is on board with the status quo. Well, yeah. I mean, you saw that in debate on oh, Wednesday night. They are right? the status quo, Marty. There, oh was, a, there was a quick fire, quick fire question session and the amount of times that Luxon and Hipkins agreed on something no, not again. was far more than when they disagreed. Yeah. And when they did disagree, it was just on the implementation of the same thing. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, so, like, national is the same as Labour. They just wear different shirts. Well, the 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 the, the a different the other cheek of the same ass. 
<laughs> I wouldn't have said that. That's also, a so Neil Oliver. We need like. we need to look at it. We need to go back to good old fashioned um, lists of hierarchy of values. If people could list their hierarchy of values of what we need to vote for coming up, and globalism, foreign investment, anti foreign investment, diversifying away from the flippant poison of China, um, and um, anti the who and the UN with all their globalism is um, very, very high on my my hierarchy of values here. You know, somewhere along the line, we stopped being our own country and gave ourselves away to um, pragmatism of the worst variety. And, and I'd like to see that back. And patriotism is huge. And can I just do a little spiel on patriotism? Because it's not a language that New Zealand speaks easily. America does. Um, New Zealand doesn't so much. Uh, we we often hear call it jingoism, right? Yeah, we're uncomfortable with it. Yeah, but really, um, I want to just um, draw from, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the scientific uh, fictionalist um, Robert Heinlein, mm-hmm. who wrote The Moon is a Hush Mistress and a whole lot of other no- novels. But- Once the monkeys discover they can vote themselves bananas, they don't bother climbing trees. I think it's a great one. It's one of his? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, Heinlein gave an address to um, the graduates of West Point back in 1973, and his whole thrust of that was patriotism. And he said that um, the man who is not patriotic is an evolutionary dead end. This is not sentiment, but the hardest of logics. Patriotism is the most practical of all human characteristics because it allows your nation to flourish. Um, He said in that speech, to the intellectuals who sneer at patriotism as if it were just some mindless jingoism, when they say that, quote, patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel, unquote, what they never mention is that the man who made that sneering remark was a fat, gluttonous slob who who was pursued all his life by a pathological fear of death. Mm -hmm. Now, I totally agree with that. Because um, I think it's now time for the freedom movement to truly rise up and be patriotic and think about their country and their countrymen and women and move to support the only party who will have a chance at taking the fight to the globalists, and that's New Zealand first. Here's Um, here's a question on, excuse me, on patriotism and the freedom movement. Do you think the freedom movement actually understand patriotism? Because if that's un- missing in their thinking, no wonder it's kind of all over the place. Yeah, good good, good observation, Paul. Um, it may be missing from New Zealand culture uh, too much um, a- as a rule because unlike the United States, as we've said before, we were f- we're not founded on being anti our government or um, we're not founded on a revolution. Hmm. New Zealand has this very... Um, spookily comfortability with um, spooky comfortability with being um, kind of in love with our governments, thinking that they'll always act for us. But what we've seen in the last, you know, three, (laughs) three to 20 years is that they will not act for us. They will not act for us unless we force them to. Um, So it's about time we actually learnt to adopt the language of patriotism. And And, and maybe that freedom movement would be more cohesive if if there was an understanding of what patriotism was. Well, patriotism just means you love your country. Well, that's, that's what I mean. And, and and have a generic consideration rather than having doubts and feeling awkward about the, the pro- yeah that we care about our fellow yeah um, and sod and anyone who doesn't go yeah. live somewhere else if you don't like it you know Heinlein yeah. also said in that speech that patriotism is another way it's a it's a polite way of saying women and children first that's a nice way of putting it yeah, yeah. because you know our patriotic men and I know there's many out there that are now standing for the um, um standing up for women and all that sort of stuff they we we women we do need men to stand up for us i don't care what any feminist says we need our men behind us to stand for us we need that we need it for our daughters well, well that's we what i found want, interesting about the wearing frocks when the young it. leaders debate with yeah, lee we don't donahue want, we don't want cocks and frocks doing it do we because the young leaders debate with lee donahue 
the only the only person standing up for women in a whole gaggle of women was a guy. Exactly. There was that that was such a beautiful slice of reality yeah. of where we're at. And we saw and we saw, you know, Chloe lead. Swalbrook hurling out the misandrist. Yeah. You know, um, epithets all the time, uh, you know, basically a bro this and cheer that and just so slovenly in the way that she speaks, uh, not making any point at all other than to call Lee Donahue a racist for anything he said. Mm. You know, it was just appalling what was going on. Oh, he, did, he did that. Oh, sorry. He, no. he did that with such dignity and. Um, He's talent. Uh, yeah, yeah, he is. He is huge talent. And again, I take I'm, my hat off to uh, Winston for letting him stand as a candidate. Really. Nine, nine, nine percent, and he's in. You've got to. You've got to look at the reasons that some of the things have happened to us that we thought were happening for a certain reason. I've made the point before about you know the CIA and the Rockefeller sponsored feminism, not to uplift women, but to create division and demoralize yeah. their most likely opponents. Yeah. And and it's the same with with all of the sudden fixation these same psychos have got on with indigenous people here and in Australia, it's to it's to leech away patriotism. Yeah, it's not to help. Be them. Proud of a country that you're yeah. constantly told is oppressive and has um, you know been the reason for all sorts of injustices. So yeah, you take the name away, you try and change the flag. It, it, it's to make it easier to get that that uh, globalist rule in there. You talk about yeah. patriotism just a moment ago. I want to play this clip. It's Alan Bollard speaking, I think, at the 2030 conference. We need to be putting a lot more into the regional agencies that are working on that. And frankly, in the medium term, we're going to need to prepare for climate refugees on a scale that is far more than we have ever thought of from coming from the Pacific Island. We're talking about potentially millions of people as they suffer climate change impacts in very difficult ways. So millions are coming. No, they're not. 15-minute cities. You know, it's the same. Be. They were talking about on the debate, they were talking about have you got the political will to move people out of these cities which are prone to floods? Yep, yep, we do. And it's the same with the islands. But that's just scaring. That, that's that's just catastrophizing. That's It's based on nothing. Those elite beachfront properties aren't going to build themselves over... Do you think he really believes that? Uh, He's a uh, banker. Yeah, I think he does. But uh, well, now, hang on, that's a good point you raised there, Marty. He is a banker. If he's a, if he's a banker, then they're in league with insurance companies and that. Our insurance uh, cover for houses on the waterfront higher at the moment or just the same as any old house that's in the Are they still lo loaning money to people who want to buy? I think they are. Yeah. I think they're still in hot demand, beachfront well, properties, aren't they? Yeah. You want to sort of buy about two hundred meters back because, in you know, in in short order, that'll be beachfront. If you listen to these, you know, doomsayers, nothing they've ever predicted has come true. Well, you know, if you really look at why the sea levels are rising on some of these islands, a lot of it comes down to fishing with parrotfish with dynamite that um, nibble up <laughs> coral and shit out sand, and then also exporting sand. That uh, creates the impression that the sea level's rising. But we've, so got, we've got an old story in our family. My grandfather was a chief surveyor of the Wellington Airport when it was built in 1959, and there were people who refused to move their houses because they had to get rid of houses to reclaim land to make the runway in the position it is. One person argued, well, there was a, a, a bunch of people arguing that if they filled that area in, it would <laughs> raise the water level. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, okay. Mm, yeah, maybe. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's just fanciful that not a single prediction that they've ever made has come true. You know, we were told by Al Gore with his little diagrams and his, you know, stupid inconvenient truth um, movie that, um, you know, by uh, a certain time the there, would, stick. there would be no ice in the North Pole. Well, there's still ice there. Yeah, still there. You know. You um, they keep, look at they keep saying Rock. that about Antarctica. They go, oh, you know, if we don't watch out, the Antarctic um, will melt. Really? So have you checked the temperatures of, you know, the average temperature on a daily basis in the South Pole? H has anybody looked? I have. Probably right? about the same, is it? It never gets higher than minus 10. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was at school, water freezes below zero, right? And uh, so if it's always minus 10, they ain't going anywhere. 
It's just not going anywhere. Uh, Winston even had a comment to make about that. He said he authorised or got the deal to do the ice core drilling. New Zealand did the ice core drilling in the Antarctic. Mm. And they did the core drilling. They pulled it up and and and, and it showed that bananas used to grow there. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> so I don't know. All right. Again, it's tempting to say, oh, these guys are just dumb. They're doing a terrible job. You know, again, as I've said before, maybe they're smarter than you think and they're doing a really good job. It's just you don't know what the job is or who yeah. you're working for. You and, don't and, know what the mission you, is. You yeah, can make a, a climate model say anything you want, and the fact is that the funding – only goes to climate models that say a certain thing. Yeah, we know what the mission is. And the mission so what, is total what, control. What is the end game? Yeah, it's total control. Well, flood New yeah. Zealand with millions of, of people, well, calling we, we Alan can, Bollard. Well, how, are they, and, how are they going to get here? Right? Are they going to come in their little banana boats, you know, sail across some of the West Oceans? And, you know, just, it's just it's bollocks. Yeah, bollards, Alan bollocks. bollocks. <laughs> okay. No, but 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 they'll they'll get here the same way that people are now getting across the American border. They're flown in. Yeah. Oh, and so hang on a second. They're climate refugees, and they're going to come here by a plane, increasing the problem, which will cause. Okay. Yeah, Alex but I mean that's that what we're up against. It's 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 that. The one thing they do not want is patriotic New Zealanders that stand for their individual freedoms. They're and, against and, that. And they're so against the country is, standing up and saying, no, we're full, sorry, you can't come here. Or yeah, it absolutely. doesn't work like that, unless there is a true emergency, but we know that that's if probably If they cared about our country, they would never have shut down Marston Point oil refinery, would they? Mm, yeah, unless they wanted to starve us of Here's the thing, right? They go fuels. on about global warming and global boiling and all of that bollocks, right? Global where, bollocks. Where do people go for their holidays in the cold winter in New Zealand? Fiji. That's right. They yeah. go to places that are tropical. You yeah. know, it, has the Maldives closed up shop and you well, know, they haven't issued, gone underwater. issued snorkels to everybody um, when you arrive? Of course not, <laughs> right? Not have the Dutch... Have the Dutch been subsumed by, you know, uh, tsunamis of uh, North Sea? Uh, Putting another six feet on the dike. On yeah, the dike. exactly. We do, mitigation is far cheaper than the bollocks that they're forcing out on us. And and who ever dreamed up the idea that taxation would solve the climate problem? Well, it solves the government revenue problem. Is huffing the same sort yeah. of hopium when you're in hopeless debt? Yeah. But they're, they're huffing the same sort of hopium that, that a fair number of people out there are thinking there's going to be two million voters come out of the woodwork <laughs> and, and, and all of a sudden um, there's going to be 42 MPs from a party no one's ever heard of. Wow, yep. we got to that. It's okay. hopium. Had to come up sometime. All right, well, there's one debate that we're – sorry, Marty, I think you were about to say something. I don't want to – Oh, no, I was, I was just saying the solution always seems to involve printing billions of dollars as debt for our children and setting it on fly, fire as a burnt offering to, to the climate fairies. Or, or turning or, up with a wheelbarrow load of it just to, yeah, to buy your it, next it, it, it always involves oh, the banks and money. Um, One of the debates just, we didn't talk about was the Maori leaders debate and uh, comments by John Tamahedi. Anyone have anything to say about that? Yeah, I, I've... I've been interested in 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 the stuff as i said not just as you know that maori shouldn't have a say on on things that happen in in new zealand through a te ao maori lens but my contention is that it, it's a remnant of of uh maori culture as a slave owner owning culture to um to think about certain people in a certain way and uh it's interesting, in the past, Willie Jackson has said, you know, the Māori Party and, and us basically agree on where we want to go. We've just got different ways of doing doing it. And there was a very telling moment in that debate where Willie Jackson uh, said, um, it works, it's nothing to be afraid of, and besides, it's a process that began under national. So that's their take. John Tamahiri um, called it a halfway house between Maori and what is rightfully theirs. So he's basically saying co-governance was just a halfway step to the where we want to go, which is you'd you'd assume full governance. And again, that's that's this um, elite um, 
Maori idea where they see themselves as rangatira, uh, looking, ruling over tutua or commoners, and uh, owning slaves. Who, who you know, if you look at at a lot of their attitudes towards um, taxpayers in New Zealand, you know, you take the fruits of their labour without reciprocity. If you have a child with one, it it gains your mana. Um, and you know that what Ballantyne said after he was misquoted in that leaders debate this week was, it's just those top elite. We call them the conspirators, the Maori separatists that w- separatists that want a base co governance come self governance on a racial based future, and we don't want that. And so, it, it's it's got to be taken out of the <clears throat> context that that we're given this argument that it's racist if you oppose co-governance. I think it's, um, as I've said before, it's the visceral reaction of the people with a proud history of abolishing slavery to being treated like a slave. Yeah. Well, we, saw that, yeah we saw that too come up in a debate the taxpayers' union had, and that little communist weasel from the Herald, Simon Wilson, was calling Jordan Williams a racist because he was opposing co-governance. And, to his credit, uh, Damien Grant just unloaded on Simon Wilson and said right. to him, you know, it's not racist to debate a point. Yeah. It's not racist. You know, got, and actually had to make Simon Wilson uh, back down, uh, saying that just because you debate something doesn't make it racist. Yeah. And jo- Jordan Williams is not a racist. Uh, and, yeah. you know, that's gone right around social media. It's not but- racist to debate it. Yeah, it's a very important point, Cam. And, you know, you could see in in the leaders' debate as well, Marama Davidson, you know, and she, they've said this several times, the Greens, the money's there to solve this poverty problem. We've just got to go and get it. The money, you know, the money that's there being mm. the money that's in the assets that are in the hands of wealthier New Zealanders. And John Tamahiri said this as well. You know, if, if our poorest people are paying a certain percentage of their income uh, and their assets in in tax, then, you know, wealthy people should pay, pay the same percentage of their assets. And, you know, the other, you the other side, Marty, or the other side always has more um, impetus and passion to fight for their communism because they have a whole system to loot. Mm. Whereas the conservative, you know, um, us holding up the conservative way of life is is hard. You've got to earn your way. You've got to struggle to um, feed your family and run a business and um, provide for people and pay your taxes. That's much harder. Yeah, to go in yeah. and loot something is easy. And it's yeah, Mar- 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 Davidson did have that we seize the precious and we want it. Sort of yeah, vibe. yeah. She's a total looter. Mm. And um, but but this is the thing that we can find discouraging, I think. I know I know I do, is that you're trying to uphold decent values for human flourishing, and then you get these looters that come in, and they are far more passionate than we are in a way because they have a system to loot. They must be met by us with the same passion to hold our traditions in place. And that is a democratic form where we have individual rights. Well, and but the see, knowledge that's of half the problem. what happens every time. <laughs> but, but, but this is half the problem, Olivia. We're trying to have a reasoned, rational debate challenging ideas. And they're not about that at all. Mm-hmm. And you just have to listen to the words that they say. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The, the, the key question here, and this was raised during that uh, that debate, was do you believe that uh, that Maori ceded sovereignty to the crown? And Willie Jackson said no. No. And John Tamahiri said no. No. And Marima Davison said no. Yeah, they've all taken oaths to the correct power so, structure. So, so we're having time. a debate. Was that disingenuous? About... Were they lying? And the one person who yes. said who stood up for was Shane Jones. Was Shane Jones. Right. And, 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 you know, but the thing is, is that we're trying to have a debate around these ideas and they're not interested in a debate. They're interested ultimately in using the point of the gun or the powers of the state to, 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 to usurp democracy and yeah. return to tribal control of New Zealand. And there's no debate that, they, that, that they're going to have. And we're wishing to have a debate with people that 
don't want to debate and are starting from a point of view that is a, a heroic rewrite of really simple principles of the treaty, that they just deny history. They deny the actual words. Yeah. And have come up with a fanciful idea that Maori never ceded sovereignty, that they were an equal to Queen Victoria, the Empress of India. Yeah, the, and that the, is not in the treaty, the first Maori language treaty. That's not in there. Well, it's no. always that the Maori version was different is, is the, other, yeah. the other thing. that's And yeah. that's where Julian Batchelor does really well in his lectures because he makes that point very clearly yeah. that he is actually upholding the original treaty in Maori. So, and that's the thing is we're, we're having a debate, an intellectual debate against unarmed people that are not capable of an intellectual debate on this yeah. because for them it's the, their starting point is that we never ceded so sovereignty and so everything's stolen, so you're going to give it back to us. <laughs> yeah. Well, also there's there's a commitment to telling the truth that can um, hobble you and all this sort of thing. So we're talking about care. climate change. Well, Antarctica is not heating up. It, it's not we're, – we're not dealing with people who are interested in the truth. They're interested in winning. Well, they're interested in looting a system. Yeah. Off our dime. And um, and same with, you know, the whole climate change, climate alarmism. You know, you only need to see where the where the um, Pilgrim Fathers landed at Pil P uh, Plymouth Rock to see that that is no more underwater than it ever was when they landed in the 17th century in America. Mm. You know, this is lies in order to take over the businesses and the wealth and the um, assets that have been built over 400 years um, and in New Zealand over 200 years of um, European settlement. They want it all. The Maoris want the, the Maori iwi, not the Maoris, but the Maori iwis are looting that system. And where will it end? I, I guess I know the answer to that. You only need to look at South Africa to see with the ANC in charge. That's where it ends. The Congo. Mm. Rwanda. Well, well, I mean, it's important that we get them to spell out where it ends. Like when John Tamahiri said, look, co-governance is just a halfway house. To, yeah, what um, a mission. Yeah, how's yeah. that going to work? Okay. Yeah, how's well, that going to yeah, work? Let, let's, have the, let's have the chat. Um, well, why was John Tamahiri even in the debate? He's not even yeah. a candidate. Yeah, how no. did that happen? You know, well, he's, he's a president. A president. I think Rowery uh, uh, Waititi had uh, been suffered a bereavement of some sort, so he had to step in. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, right. I can or see like that on a too stupid billboard. to be in a debate. Mm. <laughs> okay, all right. So um, that's that. Um, overseas, we've got a bit of time. Let's uh, get into this Trudeau. Uh, Rota, the Speaker of the Canadian House of Commons, and the uh, the Nazi Hunka, um, uh, Yaroslav Hunka, who was in the Waffen SS, it, now it turns out, in in um, Slightly Ukraine. embarrassing. Yeah, so um, surely, okay, so the speaker falls on his sword. Apparently the um, the guy, Hunker, was from his district or something, and someone <laughs> obviously figured out this was a good idea. But would you would you do that and, and, and present a guy like that in your House of Commons? Zelensky did the fist pump, by the way. He was happy. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, but he's not a Nazi, right? Um, but uh, would you do that if you're the speaker and not tell the prime minister you're about to do that? It's just weird all around. Trudeau's in on it, and he th and he threw the speaker under the bus, and then he apologised yeah. um, if anyone in Canada was offended. He didn't apologise for his own speaker doing it, mm. and the organisation for all this was under his office, as as if they would not have had his permission. You know, right? I mean, that that no, nothing would have. Nothing that serious and that well televised with Zelensky sitting in your audience in your parliament would not have. Pumping. Yeah, that, that would have gone. Trudeau knew. Um, they just thought they'd get away with it. But now, of course, it's made a whole lot worse because what's funny is that, you know, Ukraine needing to be denazified has always been one of the main reasons for Russia doing the war. Mm. in the Ukraine, and um, saying that the Ukraine was full of Nazis. Well, I mean, Exhibit A was just showing you. So why would they be uh, do an in-your-face display like they that? They don't care. The arrogance. They, Look, yeah, the, 
Yep, you know, arrogance. You, you know, with the protest in Wellington, they said if there's one Nazi in your rally, then it's a Nazi rally, right? And there's a, another one saying if there's one Nazi sitting at the table and another three people join him, there's now four Nazis at the table. Well, he was a Nazi in in Canada's parliament, promoted by Trudeau and Zelensky <clears throat> and the and speaker. all of them clapping like and like all of them clapping seals. like train, yeah train, train seals. seals. The, the whole Canadian Parliament using those things that, which ironically comes from our disinformation. There's project, something very wrong there. Right? There's something was, very wrong there. Our disinformation project fire, said if there's if there's one Nazi flag there, you've got a Nazi rally. Well, they had a Nazi standing there and, and giving them adulation. And, and, and everyone and, felt comfortable yeah. doing a standing ovation. Yeah, but we but we know Trudeau's a Nazi. Look at the way he carried on. And yeah. still you carries read, on. If you read Adolf Hitler quotes. Um, you can uh, actually think, well, that is Jacinda Ardern's playbook. You know, um, there's yeah. one, uh, the state must declare the child to be the most precious treasure of the people. I Child poverty. Yeah, as long oh. as the government is perceived as working for the benefit of children, the people will happily endure almost any curtailment of liberty and almost any deprivation. Incredible, considering they were okay with those same precious children being an experiment for Pfizer. Yeah. And the current prime yeah. minister refused to take the advice on the young ones, right? Yeah, he, he, the messaging was he, he absolutely too hard was for warned, Chippy. Yeah, he was warned not to do that, and he did it anyway. With Trudeau, then it got a whole lot worse because his deputy PM, <laughs> Christia Friedland, whose father is from that uh, that stock as well. Yeah. Um, and she's a board member of the World Economic Forum, joyously celebrating Waffen SS Nazi war criminal Yaroslav Hanka in their midst. Um, according to emerging reports, not only is she descended from Ukrainian Nazis, but she had family members who were also in the same Waffen SS Ukrainian Galatian division as Hanka within yeah. the Wehrmacht. So, I mean, Poland and Jewish groups have denounced the Waffen SS Galatia division for its role in, you know, mass murdering civilians and involvement in massacres during the war in Poland. We know how bad that was. Well, for, just for historical context, right, there's, there's the SS and there's the Waffen SS, right? They were the elite. Elites, yeah. They were the top, like, fervent. Top and they were going around doing the civilians. They had, they had the SS logo tattooed on their bicep, on the inside of their arm. Hmm. Right with with their with their service number, right? These these people Shockers. were the top of the top. They were the elite special forces of the SS, mm -hmm. and that's who they celebrated in Canada's Parliament. I, I don't know if you saw it, but a couple of days before that happened in the House of Commons, there Trudeau did a speech in the anticipation of a Zelensky arriving, where he's trying to say that we will always support Ukraine. By the way. Zelensky leaves with 650 million Canadian dollars. Anyway, just saying. But in that speech, if you look back at it, he there's something wrong. There's something up with him. He is like a possessed person, the way he's talking. Which it, one? Zelensky or, or no, Trudeau? No, no, uh, Trudeau. Trudeau. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm and, just waiting sort of for making the case. He's talking seriously, like in a Hitler sort of way, you know, sort of hysterical and, and like he's possessed by this thing. It's freaky. Well, he, he must be getting close to um, resigning for to spend more time with his family. I mean, Dan Andrews sure. is gone now. Ardern's gone. He, he won't have enough gas in the tank. He won't have he enough, won't enough, gas, won't have enough the gas in the tank. <laughs> the, the, the other thing with Don't that, get back on track. again, it's probably the why Russian, got the Waffen SS involved. You get, get a bit of extra gas in the tank. <laughs> the, the Russians came it. out morally on top in this, where, where Dmitry Peskov, uh, who's um, yep. uh, the press secretary for Putin, said... Uh, such sloppiness of memory is outrageous. Yeah. Many West, Western countries, <laughs> including Canada, have raised a young generation that does not know who fought whom or what happened during the Second World War, and they know nothing about the threat of fascism. Um, well, he's, he's probably right, actually. He's right. And, and he is completely right. They, it's only 80 years ago or so. Right. And now everybody's forgotten. Here's a 98 year old Nazi that some Nazi hunter has had to come out in Canada and say, hey, that man was fighting for the Nazis against Russia, you know, during that time. And here he's been celebrated in the, 
Canadian Parliament. It's just well, the polls are talking about extraditing. Level. The polls are talking about extraditing Hunkin now. Oh, good. I mean, let him crimes. die in a ditch somewhere, the old bastard. It, have you seen that the, the polls are moving away from the Ukrainians? Have you noticed that? There's some kind of schism. That whole not there. wanting World War Three next door thing. Maybe. That, that might, might have, have something to do, with, to do with it. They're a NATO ally, aren't they? Because Zelensky's gone. He's a walking dead man. You, you can't get, you can't survive after throwing 500,000 of your young men into the meat grinder and losing 25 million of your population. His well, own Chris country Hipkins, hate him. Yeah. If Chris Hipkins was saying, look, we'll fight until the last New Zealander is dead, you'd think most <laughs> of us would go, what? Well, is you want to take him out. Yeah. Be, oh, okay. Um, well, can you be the one to start? Yeah. Well, they did you try that. Off, they did try that a year and a half ago, right? Or two uh, years ago. ago. But you and can and, and all I will say is that I'm no friend of Putin. I do not like that man. Um, and I think what he's done is reprehensible. Wicked. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 but, Maybe not in the context but, of a but Russian. I though. do understand. No, but I I understand that for two years before that war broke out, he was petitioning the UN, the Security Council, saying we will not tolerate NATO advancement on our borders. We're just not going to tolerate it, and we will respond. He made they had a signed clear. deal with Zelensky, signed, if we're to believe it. Boris Johnson turns up because old Uncle Joe, somewhere in there, told him to, and they rip it up. What do they expect, I, I don't man? believe that that was signed, Paul. Um, it was in play, and he was going I, to look I, at it. I've seen it reported that Zelensky had actually signed it. Mm, well, possibly. I don't know that. Um I, I know that he had his okay for one to the signature, but still to blow points. that up, to blow yeah, that no, up no, and put no, all Boris, those young Boris people completely. into the meat grinder. Yeah, yeah, Bor Boris, that's on Boris's head because Zelensky, for the sake of his nation and with his people behind him, wanted a peace deal. Yeah, and was talked out of it. I don't think anyone was signed. And the Bidens have been shaking was... down the Ukrainians for years. So what you know, what's been going on there? Eh? <sighs> Back to who, who doesn't want who to see what? Well, you know, if you go back to Adolf Hitler, it's, it's another quote. It's the bio a special secret pleasure how the people around us fail to realize what is really happening to them. And there is that um, duper's delight that so many of these narcissists in power have where they think, you know, you're so stupid, you deserve what's happening to you. Well, that, and, yeah. Uh, well yeah, that's right. If you're such a schmuck and you let us do it to you, too bad, right? So Yeah, we, we've got to start tragic. talking about how we've let people with personality disorders um, get to be in charge of it. Because they're promoted um, through media and uh, propaganda to be well, something, appear yeah. to be something that they're not. And they're, they, they, those types are attracted to wielding power over other people, hence they're, politics. They're a is tool often. for the people who are printing the money ultimately, though, to, yeah. to achieve their ends. And then well, there's it, Klaus. <laughs> yeah. We won't go there. All right, um, we, we're coming up against time. Um, what about, uh, just quickly back, because this catches my eye, the traffic light system is being talked about again. And yes. but in, in this case, it's uh, to introduce benefit sanctions. Who would use the traffic light system? Who who can't read the room? A hooplehead. A total yeah. hooplehead. I mean, that, that, that term, that phraseology, that title has been completely discredited. I hate it. Mm -hmm. Has it has it been discredited by maybe people feel safe and comfortable when it's used uh oh, it's a traffic apart light from system. a tiny minority? Oh my uh, God. Or, Please give us a travel traffic light system, mummy. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll tell you how it works. It's it's the green uh the compliant category uh meeting their obligations to prepare for or find work, so there's no change to their benefit. Uh people in the orange, which is some risk category, would have one or two breaches of their obligations and they face additional requirements and targeted support seconds. and the red light or high risk category have breached their obligations three times and uh, they'll face sanctions such as benefit, reductions, benefit suspension money management and mandatory community work experience mandatory louise, vaccination. louise upston cam you you probably um know her better than us but um yeah that's it's never going to work yeah. And it'll never work because the bureaucracy will work to rule, won't implement it, won't operate it, uh, and everything will get changed. You know, 
it, all these wonderful motherhood and apple pie statements about how we're going to solve these problems, and they come up with these fanciful things, and then they let the uh, the um, they let the bureaucrats then implement it, and, and it gets watered down. So it's never going to work. It's it's just fanciful to even think that it will. And they just really need to stick to simple stuff. But I don't mm. think the National Party is capable of that. But using that traffic light system, it's like in the, in, in those action movies, you, you've always got to have something that's counting down to an explosion. So there's always that counter going down and, you know, people get it that way. This is like the way they do the climate now. So it's orange if it's not that bad, but it's red if it's really bad. What if you're complying to everything? Are you in green, are you? I missed that. Yeah. The problem that, I mean, I don't know if you've ever talked to someone who's been on a benefit and, and is looking at getting a job. They do what I, I tend to call beneficiary maths. And what they do is they work out how many um, dollars they get paid on a benefit. Then they divide that by how many hours they're going to work and look at the difference and arrive at the conclusion, well, I'm only, I'm only getting paid $2 an hour to do this job. Why would I work for two dollars an hour? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a point. Did you see yeah. um, Winston Peters talk about uh, job seeker? The 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 job seeker will be limited at two years in your lifetime to be paid yeah. a an an employment benefit. <laughs> I mean, that's that's very extreme. I th- I, didn't Clinton in a good do that? Way. That's a, that's a Clinton, Bill Clinton. Well, policy, just. I think. Um, just I don't I don't know I mean I think it is yeah but but you know the idea that limit because I I mean I know people in my life well they're sort of on the outskirts of my life but who have been on a, a form of benefit for thirty years well and, nice that um, we could help <laughs> yeah and um, they're two they're rare and delicate flowers who are often artistic and they can't do a normal job anywhere I mean I've done every job from caregiving to selling to Selling cars. I mean, I have done. You name it, I've done it. Um, things I wouldn't even admit on air. Maybe I we should done. play a game of bingo. You've been in the green zone all this time. <laughs> well, well, just the employed zone, you know, for pretty much most of it. Um, did you get to collecting them eventually? I but, did that. Yeah, but but eventually, um, well, Bob Jones actually said I sent him a letter once, and um, and he mocked me for being a used car salesperson. <laughs> I've been a used car salesperson. It, it was a horrible yeah. job, but it downloads some software into your brain that is so good. It was quite a good job. It was, um, you know, I, I, I mean, you know, it, it, I had three children to provide for. It was, it was great. I got commission as well as a stipend, as well as a company car, as well as company laptop and Doesn't phone. Sound too bad at all. Petrol paid for. It was actually not a bad job. But um, anyway, remember Billy T's workers often. As well. Remember Billy Billy T sketch, the used car sales sketch with the Mark III <laughs> Zephyr and everything. <laughs> it's classic. You know, with um, yeah. with the work, with the work, you know, getting back to work, it's hard if you haven't been working to get back to work. And it's like when someone who's super fit takes someone who's a couch potato and tries to get them exercising, just flogs the shit out of them. And the mm. next day they're sore as hell yeah. and they never want to do that again. You've got to sort of do it so you just say to someone who's just getting started, okay, get your shoes on. Let's walk to the end of the street and back. You feel better? You feel good? Right, that's all. And, and Well, that two-year that two year span in a lifetime could work in that way. Yeah, that seems fair enough, doesn't it? But there's, if you look through um, Maori uh, whaka toki, there's, there's all of these um, – um, odes to the joy of hard work. You know, they they could use that as well. Um, well, I mean, we're the, we're going we're going to come under harsh austerity because um, as Fazan Arani, who's so brilliant, Paul, um, every week is pointing out the system is going to. It's going just to a matter collapse. of when, according to. It's to just Fazen. a matter of when, and then we'll get austerity measures and. Goodness knows what that's going to look like. I think like. we should get that over and done with now. But, um, but we need to deal with beneficiaries because, you, you know, yeah, I mean, a hand up turned into a flipping multi-generational lifestyle on the dole, didn't it? And I'm pleased to see that Winston has at least got the nuts to address that going forward because it's a very important one. You can't have people leeching off our um, – off, off, uh, it's classic Marxism, you know, each according to their – ability to each according to their need. It's like another person's need should not have a claim over my ability or your ability or anybody and with else's a, ability. with a falling birth rate and add to an already falling birth rate a 28% reduction in live births. 
Oh, no one's going to be, there's, there just won't be the population to support it. 37% increase in people too disabled to work. And, you know, you can yeah. see that on the news. And ever since Marie said that, I think about that every time I hear, you know, someone on the news saying, oh, well, you know, we've, we've got this drop in consumer confidence. Normally that leads to a, a, an increase in unemployment, but we're not seeing that. That's why. Well, why is Auckland Airport in chaos? Someone tell me why an airport that's been operating for 50 years now all of a sudden can't handle the normal flow of traffic. I have, I have no Incompetence. Incompetence. Maybe they don't have enough people. Where are they? 37%. Before we end, Paul, can we go to my 57-year-old man who knows I think that's a brilliant place to end. Let's do that I, now. It's a nice positive story because everything's so dire. God but, knows we um, need it. For all the Waffen SS and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah no, no Nazis waffle. involved in this story. <clears throat> 50 set three. So a um, former um, farm manager has written a book called A Journey Toward Literacy, um, proving it's never too late to learn. So during a 40-year farming career in the Deep South, Michael King Potoki devised an elaborate bag of tricks to hide the fact for all those years that he could not read. It amazes me how people can do that. It's incredible. Well, that's not yeah. a stupid man. No, it? that's a smart man. That is a that is a very smart man. But he said that I told little white, white lies um, um, like I didn't bring my glasses and that's how he got around things um, so that they would read things that's out. That's actually a quite a good simple one, yeah. Yeah, and but but here here he was saying that I was embarrassed of myself, and if they knew that I couldn't read or write, what were they going to do? Fire me? Um, would they say that there's no job? And so he was scared of it. So he told all these white lies to get around the fact that he couldn't actually read, and he's 57. So that would have been when we had a world class educational system, mm, mm. right? So you can only imagine how bad it is now. And we were sent something the other day that said that 15-year-olds, 35% of them struggled to read and write. 35% mm, yeah. in the new um, education system. So it's it struck me as sad. But all I want to say is to Michael King Potiki, good on you for learning to read when it was of a value to him to want to be able to read to his grandchildren. That's very special. It is. Mm. I mean, really. And... Uh, the whole world opens to you when you can read. And we don't think about it because all of us can. But think how shut down somebody is from And, and the mental gymnastics one has to do to keep up the pretense. I know. It's incredible. You think well, about that. You have to cover every smart. track all yeah. the time. Even more, you think about we've just had six years where the most numerous a numerous uh, occupation in our parliament's been teacher or ex-teacher, and it's gotten worse. Our literacy and numeracy has gotten worse. And, yeah. and it has real consequences in terms of kids rather than embarking on a challenging career that's useful so to society, ending up in jail or angry, to get or, angry, or in poverty. Yeah, it, it, it's, it should be an urgent priority. Yeah, and that guy, that guy was always employed. Even without yeah. being able to yeah. read, he was always employed. And there'll be others like him. But but he's been limited. Right. I mean, when I was at university, I boarded with a family where the the f husband in the family couldn't read, functionally illiterate, and he was a B-grade mechanic. And the reason why he was a B-grade mechanic, even though he was a brilliant mechanic, was that in order to be an A-grade mechanic, you had to sit an exam. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And so his life, his entire life, and that of his family has been limited by his inability to read. It's a disabling uh, affliction. Is that, that an inability to oh, learn, it's a handicap. Or, or or not wanting to no, learn? Or no, no, or, no, he, no. It, it's look, it's just a failure of the education system over decades. This We've guy, this guy said ourselves. that he went to a teacher when he was twelve years old and said, "I really want to know how to read. Could you please teach me?" And the teacher said. No, you're too old. Oh, great. He was 12. No one and he, left behind. Hmm. Can you imagine? It must have been humiliating for him to admit that to a teacher and ask for that help. And, and then get rejected like that. And then get rejected. I mean, mind you, mind you, anyone can learn to read at any time. There's that too, okay? Um, well, yeah. it's easier if you're young because you've got brain plasticity. And, and learning yeah. to read, um, it, it basically um, co-opts uh, part of your brain that's used for hearing. Uh, into your visual system. 
So there's there's a bit of messing yeah. around with the brain that means that it, 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 it's harder as you get older to do. Yeah, that. reading but, and writing is not natural. It's a learned thing. Oral yeah. is natural, but no, but it gives you the ability to conceptually yeah. think and conceptually yeah. form. But it doesn't come easy like just learning to talk does. No, you you've got to do it. And and you know, kids, it always amazes me when TV is so good how into reading stories kids are. And if you read them a story, they'll ask you about characters subsequently in a way that they don't. Um, if you if you if they're watching it's, TV. it's richer and uh, i've talked to a few homeschooling parents on this program and a few have told me because i've asked them well how do you do your curriculum and and really they say if your kid can read and loves mm. to read mm. that's kind of mm. most of their education right there it is it is there's no need to go to university when you can read yeah a- aside from the piece of paper that the 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 Bachelor of Arts or, or whatever gives you, um, you you can know your world, profoundly know your world, if you know how to read. We had a Gaslighter of the Week award. Maybe we should have another award for people who really impress, like that chap. Like a 57-year-old man that decides, no, yeah. I'm going to read to my grandchildren. That's like what I want. Hero sort of award. No, I think that's a positive idea because Gaslight is always focusing on the negative. And like I, I think we really <laughs> this should. This from Cam Slater. I think I we really it. should celebrate people who have, despite adversity, uh, broken free from the life that crappy, useless teachers have sentenced them to. Yeah. And mm. and that's the reality of it. We've lied to ourselves for decades in this country, telling the world we have a world class education system. And if you ever want proof that we don't, it's this man. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to write media for the Polytech in uh, in Gisborne, and and I, I wrote a lot of stories about people who were the first in their family to get a qualification, and and the joy that it gave them and the pride was was so touching and moving to um, to see. It, it really affected me, and I I, I guess it, it drives me to be cross about the failure of the education system generally? Well, um, I know when in a previous relationship, my stepdaughter, she were, they were under our care and it was me who picked up that she could not read. And I picked it up because I used to read to my kids and those beautiful girls um, when they're in my care and I noticed that she was cagey and a bit, uh, you mm. know, she would get um, anxious. She would get really anxious. Um it turned out that she couldn't read. So I, you know, tabled that with her father and we sent her to Kit McGrath. And um, sure enough, she was one of those um, kids that was such a people pleaser that she just fell through the system by being yep. helpful. Um, really lovely girl. And she ended up suddenly just being so relieved because the whole world opened to her. And she is a lawyer now. Wow. wow. Yeah. Cool for you. Yeah. I think that's a really good note to end on. Yeah. This week. Positive. Yeah, positive. Yeah. In oh, the God. green zone. <laughs> In the green zone. Yeah. Not orange or red, all right? <laughs> yep. Okay. Yeah. A traffic light system for success. For maybe success. we should adopt one. Political panel traffic light system. Well, maybe. We'll work on it. Yeah, we'll Cam, work you, you work out how we can integrate an idea. I think it just needs to have two lights. We don't need to have an orange. It's red or, or green. <laughs> You're going to say go, blue. Go or no go. You either can or you can't. Yeah, that's yes, what Yoda no. said. Right? Isn't that what Yoda yeah. said? Yoda. Yeah, I mean, he, he said there is do no try. Do not. There is no try. Do, do or do not. There is no try. All right. Huh. Okay. Well, that was an interesting uh, political panel for this Friday morning. Thanks to Marty Gibson, thanks to Olivia Pearson, and thank you to Cam Slater. And we'll do thank it all you, again Paul. in a week's time. Thank no problem. You. Anytime. Thank you, Paul. Have a great week. RCR with Paul Brennan. Reality Check Radio.